From the Oregon State University Extension Service, this is Pollination, a podcast that tells the stories of researchers, land managers, and concerned citizens making bold strides to improve the health of pollinators. I'm your host, Dr. Adoni Melithopoulos, Assistant Professor in Pollinator Health in the Department of Horticulture. K-12 education on insect pollinators is really poor in the U.S., and this was exemplified, if you remember, one of the early episodes of the show with Joseph Wilson, where most people really underestimate the species diversity of something like bees. Now, this is a particularly difficult problem to solve because teachers lack the experience, and there just aren't teaching tools available in the classroom to give students a rich experience with insect pollinators. And that's why I'm so excited to have our next guest, Megan Swanson. She's the program manager with the Bee Cause Project, which is a not-for-profit that has focused on a number of things, but one of the key things they do is they install observation honeybee hives in schools around the U.S. and beyond. And so Students get a real tangible experience of bees, which can connect up with larger STEM learning objectives, but really provide some basic literacy on insect pollinators in our schools. And for those of you who think, oh, bees in schools, that doesn't seem like a great idea. It's good to point out that the uh, Oregon School Garden Network has about, there's about two dozen schools that already have honeybees. A number of schools have mason bees. There are already educators out there who are really blending bees and pollinators into their curricula. This is a great episode to give you some ideas on how you can join them in uh, getting some fundamental education on pollinators into our schools. Hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to Pollination. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Now, um, can you just set up the episode? Tell us a little bit about the challenges facing students and educators in the U.S. today when it comes to pollinator literacy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Challenges facing students and educators in the U.S. today when it comes to pollinator literacy center largely, in our opinion, around a general disconnect from the subject at hand. Um, For example, how many times do we look at a plate of food and think to thank our pollinators or the place that it has come from, or we think about them at all. Uh So there's a well-traveled statistic that one in three bites of food is due to the work of pollinators. However, almost all of our food indirectly or directly comes from an environment where pollinators add to the quality, taste, or amount that could be produced. So students can't feel or find a connection in that tangible way. Um, instead of reading through a textbook, Mm -hmm. that makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, But when you put it in front of their eyes and ears and allow them to hear the hum of the honeybee and gain a bit of ownership over the hive success, that's when you really start to build a bridge. That's fantastic. And I guess that's a great lead into my next question, because I think this is what the Bee Cause Project is really designed to do. Can you tell us what prompted it? uh, Yeah. uh, uh, And how did you kind of sort of deliberately at the beginning sort of see yourself as addressing these challenges? Yeah, absolutely. So the Bee Cause Project started as a conversation between Tammy Enright, our director and beekeeper, and Ted Dennard, the owner and founder of the Savannah Bee Company. Um, Both of them are beekeepers and friends, and they were wondering how they could provide opportunities for their own children to connect more with their environment. So they started off and installed their first observation hive. They really hit the ground running um, in a local school in the Charleston, South Carolina area. And the rest is kind of history since that (laughs) initial hive. The Bee Cause has partnered with a lot of really, really wonderful dedicated sponsors. And we provided over 450 grants to programs in all 50 states, Canada, the Bahamas, and Puerto Rico to date. Oh, great. So that's been a lot of fun. Okay. So uh, just back, uh, uh, you're going to need to sort of explain this program. So it's funds, but also you were talking about it starts with beehives. Just kind of walk us through the different programs, like how... um, uh, if I was a school or something, and you know, what kind of programs would be available through Because? Yeah, so first off, all of our programs are available to any nonprofit or school who wishes to build a B program. And it helps to understand what that is in order to understand the diverse programs that we provide. So a B program is where we want to help build the buzz on your campus or organizational area 
and have teaching tools available to get your toes wet with either a lesson plan that centers around monitors and is core compliant or those who are ready to just totally dive in and welcome live bees on campus. So the bee program can be really anything you want it to be. Um, so we start there and then we begin with assessing the current needs and learning environments of each program. We begin with encouraging ed educators to start with the BCAUSE curriculum and build that foundation of knowledge at their school. You generate buzz, for lack of a better word, <laughs> and you really get the student population excited and enthusiastic about pollinators through bringing in beekeepers, local experts, and then you can welcome an actual hive with live bees if that is allowed on your campus. And welcoming live bees, that can seem a little unusual. However, we've just seen absolute enthusiasm and nothing but support from our programs that really adopt these principles of observational learning. Um, it's the benefits are the benefits are infinite, and we've just seen such successes with that. Um, so all of our programs are surrounding that observational learning, whether it is a lesson plan that takes your students outside, and those are available on our website on the resources page, or if you want to apply to the grant program, which is called the B Grant, and that opens every September. Our largest partner is the Whole Kids Foundation, and they help us to provide the B Grant, and that application opens in September, closes in October, and that's where you can apply to receive a B grant for your nonprofit or school. The, oh, great. That's that's a lot. Let, maybe let's just uh, go through a, a, a few of those parts. So the getting bees on campus, yeah, I imagine, totally. is a, a complicated thing. But I do uh, for people in Oregon who are interested, um, you can uh, Oregon Department of uh, the School Garden Network uh, program has an Oregon Department of Education uh, portal and mm -hmm. you can see that there's you know there's 20 30 schools uh, around Oregon that have uh, honeybees on uh, on site but it is a tricky thing I imagine for a lot of schools there's the trepidation of safety yeah, uh, yeah so tell Absolutely. us yeah tell us a little bit about how that gets negotiated because I imagine after the bees are in in people are like oh this works fine but uh, that uh, at the <laughs> outset it's um people have concerns for sure. And we find that education is really the key to welcoming live bees on campus, as education is the key to a lot of things. So a lot of people don't know that the pollinators or insects that they might be more wary of, such as the yellow jacket, because they can be tricky little guys and girls, um, those insects are not honeybees. And that's the first conversation we start with, which might sound funny. Um, but we begin to educate the larger school community, including parents. We have templates for letters to parents, letters to educators, and we create safety plans and get the students involved. Oh. So that bounces back to building that foundation and building that friendly rapport about talking about bugs and insects. It really starts the conversation moving forward. And then the more logistical side of things, when you need to work with an administration or the superintendent of your school district, for example, we've done this several times before. There's over 450 programs. So if we need someone regionally to connect with another program who's already been approved, they've had difficulties working with their insurance, but have overcome that and really educated everyone about the benefits of these hives. We really like to connect everyone with someone in their local community who's done it before. We're lucky that the Because Network is building, and there's almost always someone in a close radius who can provide advice or a shoulder to lean on if the if the road seems a little difficult at the time. Um, but we That's do a pretty good job of showing the benefits of these teaching tools. That's really impressive, and I what I what I really it, and really thought out. I really like how um, when you started with that answer, just the the way in which um, it really is about all those all those pe people get engaged. The students, the parents, the administrators, really kind of um, uh, and and that safety plan up front, just showing that this has been thought out. This is deliberate. Uh, we've done this before. Yeah. Yeah. That it, this is not. Um, there's not a lot of risk involved. That you can have a. Uh, uh, no, and something. we're very intentional with 
exactly what you said. We're very intentional with the way we introduce these ideas. Libraries are not for every campus. They're very exciting and they're a wonderful teaching tool, but we do offer other ways to enjoy pollinators and bees in your curriculum and your regularly ex scheduled existing curriculum. But we do like to encourage everyone to just start with those tiny teaching moments and connect with everyone in their community to learn that bees forage very far away from their hive. So if you see a bee on campus, it might not be the bee from your hive. And that in itself really opens doors, that tiny fact, to welcoming a lot more knowledge about what type of bee you're seeing around you. Is it from this hive? And then it just opens up so much more. I imagine there are educators whose ears perked up when they heard that there's a grant that they can apply for. What's in, um, tell us a little bit about that procedure and what, the, uh, what qualifies under the grants. Absolutely. We are very excited to offer every year. It is called BB Grant. And that is <laughs> offered in tandem with the whole kids. I know, super creative name, guys. Awesome. Um, that is offered every year in September. And it is offered in tandem with the Whole Kids Foundation. So they graciously sponsor several B grants every year. This year, they're sponsoring 100 B grant programs. Wow. So what those grants include are an option to receive an observation hive, a traditional outdoor hive, or a monetary option. So you can create your own experience with live bees on campus, whether that's native bees, creating a bee sanctuary for existing hives, and so on. So if you are an educator or a leader in your own community, whether it's a nature center, museum, library, and so on, you can apply. It begins around September 1st of every year, and the application closes at the end of October. Okay. So we make those decisions around December, and then the equipment is shipped out in January, just in time to set it up and welcome your bees, depending upon your location, in the spring. So we see a lot of bee festivals and a lot of very, very fun and creative school community welcome boards, welcome activities when they welcome their bees every spring. It's a super fun time of the year for everyone involved. <laughs> well, fantastic. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of calls uh, from the Pacific Northwest after this episode, but um, <laughs> uh, let's take a... We hope so. Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I think this is this is really great. And there's a lot of interest. I know from extensions perspective, we get a lot of calls from educators who really, especially like grade two and grade four, I don't know what it is about those two grades, but there seems to be, it seems to be coming into science <laughs> curricula a lot. And um, mm -hmm. they really need resources. So this is, uh, I can just imagine, uh, I'll be directing people to listen to this podcast. It's like, well, here you go. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. And just so everyone does know, each grant program, you are required to partner with a local beekeeper. That's not only to increase the connections and network within your own community and build your hive, pun intended, but we do that in order to help manage that hive throughout the year. So in that application process, if you think you might be interested in applying for next year, just be thinking about who you might connect with in your own community, who is a beekeeper or beekeeper association. Oh, and I may just uh, here uh, plug, Tammy, uh, for those of you who are educators and don't know, we have a master beekeeping program here in Oregon. And the those are uh, well-trained um uh, volunteers and they do need volunteer hours so they're uh, if you do have if you are contemplating your grant uh, definitely reach out to the Oregon master we'll, we'll put a link both to um, uh, put all the links in the show notes but that, that's an opportunity to pair with the beekeeper but I also really love that that uh, angle because I think one of the spirits of some of these um, uh, school farm programs is to connect um, Coming back to your real your start of like people's um, connection to the food, making it more tangible, and part of that, I guess, is you know meeting the beekeeper. Yes, exactly. Okay, let's take a quick break, uh, and we'll come back. I want to hear a little bit more about um, uh, uh, getting involved, and also uh, maybe some examples of some um, uh, how this rolls out in some schools. Looking forward to it. Okay. 
Hey, welcome back. So um, tell us about some examples of uh, how this has been implemented at some schools. I'm sure you've got lots of stories of uh, uh, successes and um, impacts. Um, tell us a few stories. Yeah, absolutely. This is our favorite part, getting to brag on all of the Z grant programs <laughs> and trying to make sure everyone knows how fun it is. And it's not just the fun. This is the because is making great strides in programs, but more so the grant recipients are making fantastic strides in their own communities towards helping bees and pollinators of all types. Um, so I'll just, I wanted to share about two of we don't have a favorite program, but we do love to brag on all of our programs. Since we don't have enough time, I'll start <laughs> with a local, a program local to Charleston. And this is at an all-girls school called Ashley Hall. They are one of our longest running B programs. They received the B grant several years ago. They already had live bees on campus, and they are actually located in the downtown peninsula of Charleston. So it does qualify as urban beekeeping. They now have an observation hive, a top bar rooftop hive, and several traditional hives. Oh my goodness. So I know they are just rocking it at this school. <laughs> and these ladies work with our tinier creatures, the other ladies, and they have implemented pollinator education beginning in the younger elementary levels. And then those same students are given the opportunity when they get older to join the bee club. And this bee club is fully, it's completely students. They have a teacher who assists and they begin managing the hives on campus. So they harvest honey, they watch for pests, they observe environmental effects on the hives, the differences between keeping in a hive in an urban area versus elsewhere. It's pretty fantastic to see these young women not only managing beehives, but also connecting themselves with their surrounding environment. So that's a great opportunity for not only their traditional core curriculum, but also for the extracurricular and getting involved outside of school. I really like that example with the idea of like starting an elementary school with the basics and then having a bee club that you yeah. can graduate into uh, the, the continuum yeah. that you're really kind of like by the time you join the bee club, you've had, um, you know, some of the you, you've become familiar with them. That's a great model. I like that. Yeah, we really encourage a lot of our schools to grow their structured bee programs that way. And everyone starts at a different point, depending upon if it's an elementary, middle, or high school, or well beyond that. We work with all ages of educational opportunities. Fortunately, Ashley Hall has a wide range of grades, so they can work a little bit more training younger students, and then the older students can get into the hives. We also have another program where high school students go into local elementary programs and teach what they have learned. So it's really applicable to a lot of different learning opportunities that way. And it helps you to connect with your local educational community, which what younger elementary school doesn't want to hang out with a cool older kid, you know? <laughs> I heard I was talking with one of the teachers at Amity uh, School here in uh, in Oregon near McMinnville, and it was something he told me something similar to that. With a, they have a horticulture program, uh, and uh, okay. and just the way in which the older students can do this peer teaching to the younger students, and it can be very effective. I I never thought about that, but that's uh, and it gives them experience as well. The older students um, teaching well, what they for know, sure, and yeah. it gives them experience teaching and just little little learning that you can learn so much from the bees but also they provide great opportunities like public speaking um i myself am very nervous about public speaking it doesn't come naturally to me but within those tinier opportunities to teach younger students you start implementing these tools that really help in everyday life so the bees the bees just keep on giving and giving <laughs> you have a couple more examples i think yeah, for sure. I, I would go on for this stuff. Um, <laughs> one of our other programs that we've been working with lately is located in Puerto Rico. And there is an organization called the Be a Bee Initiative in San Juan, Puerto Rico. 
and an incredibly accomplished young woman began this initiative as a way to out educate her fellow students and community members about honeybees, particularly after Hurricane Maria devastated the island. Her message is expanded to show how pollinators provide vital pollination to Puerto Rican crops and assist in other industries, which is not only interesting, but important for island educational communities to understand and grow community members who know what role these pollinators play when they're rebuilding certain areas. Um, her school has an observation hive. They received it through the Bee Grant Program. And she also works within the community alongside the B2B volunteers to really promote the message and assist other schools to apply for the B grant, create bilingual teaching tools, work with local beekeepers. They are just, they are super busy and <laughs> the program has expanded and into something we really couldn't imagine to begin with. And we're just so proud of her and the St. John School in San Juan. It's been fantastic. I guess that's a great example of how schools can also be community learning centers. And I've thought about this with some of the, you know, we have schools in, uh, you know, not in the urban center sometimes where um, they are community hubs. And here it seems a great example of the, uh, the school program also having this larger impact outside the school. Yes, definitely. Or if you have a hive at a library, we have, several library hives, um, whether they're in a study room or they're in other bodies of the library. And we had a couple librarians at the Georgia Library Conference that we went to this past fall, and I love their message about any librarian loves when there is a car in every single parking spot, or they have their library just filled to the brim with community members. And one of our specific library programs in Hancock County, there has been so much ownership by the community over this time. The entire local keepers association takes care of the hive, not one, but many. Oh. And what better message about that bees could give to us other than the power of teamwork and coming together as a community. And now that whole beekeeper association uses the library for their monthly meetings. So it's really it's really been a wonderful community effort. I would I would brag on that program all day long. They always have <laughs> such wonderful ideas about having a community name the queen, which they ended with honey. So it's been really wonderful to witness. You know what I, I, I we should do is that I, I bet that there's a lot of beekeepers on this uh, who are listening to this episode say, oh, uh, observation, I know exactly what you you mean, but I imagine for educators, mm -hmm. it, it's a, it tell, walk us through what the observation hive is and uh, how your observation yeah, hive is structured it. for educational purposes. Absolutely. So our observation hive is the equivalent of an eight-frame hive body, and we arrange them in a vertical manner. The hives are fully plexiglassed in, there is an exit tube, and we suggest the tube being no longer than around four feet. Normally, it's very short. This exits through an exterior wall. And then the exit area, we make sure that wherever that is, it's in a low traffic area, or you can put a fence right around it. So these hives are, if you flip the TV on their side, that's, that's the BTV. And we also provide through the grant program a quilted cover that's made locally. Um, and that quilted cover allows for the darkness and a little bit of insulation for each hive. So when you're not observing, you can put that cover over it. Um, for any of our listeners or listeners out there, the beehive is traditionally a dark space. It's in a tree or a hole in the ground on the side of a house or in a traditional beehive, it's very dark inside. So that just helps, helps it out. Um, but you can view and observe at any point during the day, and they are, they are always active. They're always buzzing. And I suppose the, the, the great thing is, but what, just one kind of technical thing. So it's eight frames, so it can't be eight frames tall, is it? It's, it's four frames and four frames side by side? Or is it eight yeah. frames tall? So there's... There's two frames. No, it's, there's two frames at a time. So you would have two, 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 and two. 
Okay. And they're sandwiched together so that the queen is normally on the inside. Um, we do spot the queen every once in a while in our observation hives, normally when they're bustling in the spring and the summer. But yeah, their sandwich allows for them to generate more warmth. Um, I do like to mention in the winter with a lot of our grant programs, we do suggest in colder areas, which we don't experience as much in Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> We're a little a little heated down here normally. <laughs> but um, in our colder areas, we do suggest re- putting the bees and working with your beekeeper to overwinter them in a local bee yard or apiary since it's easier for bees in colder climates than for winter more traditional setting where they can regulate their temperature and we provide teaching tools like little learning frames that have high-res images with lessons and suggestions on top of them so you can hang those in the observation hive oh, great. But during the colder months and then the bees have a more naturalized habitat to overwinter and there must be the excitement of like when are the bees coming <laughs> Absolutely. That's what that's really our favorite part. You can welcome the bees back in the spring. If you're a library, you have a little bit more year round availability to witness the seasons and how that affects the hive. And then in the fall, you can have a little bit of a honey harvest festival. You can group up with your local farmers market. There's really endless possibilities as to how to connect with the community on these programs. But at its base, the Seasonal changes of the hive provide lessons in their own right to see what bees are doing at any given point throughout the year. And just, I mean, these are really great. I I remember someone saying that the only Nobel Prize that's ever been awarded to an entomologist was done on one of these observation hives, uh, Carl von Frisch. This is, you can do, um, you can do very basic things with uh, young students in them, just observ- observing the different casts. Uh, the different developmental cycles, but you can do pretty complicated, you know, AP level work on an observation hive. Absolutely. And I didn't know that about the Nobel Peace Prize, so I will have to look that up after after today. And yeah, we, our hives are large, our grant programs are largely for students and organizations who benefit students in K through 12. But the because we understand that creating environmental stewards and creating that next generation of environmental stewards, that doesn't mean that you're in kindergarten or high school. That could mean that you are an adult our age who is interested but has just never known. And we really like to promote huh. this education at any age, and that's why the observation hives are so great. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a sparkle in someone's <laughs> eyes until I've seen them look look into an observation hive as an adult or a child and understand the magic of it. It's really, it's contagious. The enthusiasm is absolutely contagious. And then once you get that enthusiasm, you want to take a beekeeping course or go home and see if your home is pollinator friendly. Little, little moments like that really add up. So I, I think that message in itself is absolutely Nobel Peace Prize worthy. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well, let's take another break and we'll come back. I have a couple questions. I ask all my guests the same questions. I'm interested in what your answers are going to be. All right, we're back. So these are the questions I ask all my guests. I'm not picking on you or anything. <laughs> so first, Thank you. Qu- first question is, um, do you have a book recommendation? Yes, absolutely. This was difficult for me. I love to read. <laughs> okay. So I have one that's specific for K through 12 education. I think I've enjoyed it more than anyone and I'm beyond the age range, but it's called Bees, A Honeyed History. And the author has done such a wonderful job of encapsulating the vast reach of the message of bees in history, science, technology, really? and the environment. It is not a long book, but it is so colorful and it goes from the symbolism of bees in all cultures to the stories in history like Alexander the Great and really are so intricately involved in our own story. So that would be my first option. And then my second option is one 
that is a personal favorite, and it's called Honeybee Democracy by Tom Seeley, a professor at Cornell University. And I would assume that you know about this one as well. Um, it's a favorite among beekeepers since Tom is such an advocate of beekeeping research and education. It really tells how beehives can teach us how larger communities can work as a whole to make decisions together. So I think that's a good lesson in any respect. And then he backs it up with research, which is always wonderful. <laughs> Honeybee Democracy is much recommended on this show, and I, I but I, I, I don't know if, I, Tom, I think Tom would be very pleased to hear um, 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 it sort of spoken about in terms of, uh, you know, educating, um, educating people across the United States who are, uh, you know, um, going to, uh, going to school and stuff. I think you'd think it would be an awesome connection. <laughs> 100%. Okay, so go to tool. Is there a tool that you you know find indispensable? Or you really want um, our listeners to know about? Yes. So our number one tool that we're known for is the observation hive. However, I want this to be applicable to everyone. So it's outside of the box and outside of the classroom. But our number one tool, aside from the observation hive, is your campus. Whether you are in a school or you're at a nature center, a museum, a library, there are always grounds surrounding that campus. If you're in an urban area, you could go to a park close by. And we have an activity called the Community Mapping Lesson Plan. And what you do is you assess that area. And any age can do this. It, depending upon your age or educational level, you can get more involved but you can map how pollinator friendly that area is in terms of pesticide usage, if you have a water source, if you have a pollinator friendly plant for every season of the year. So you can take your students and walk around the campus, draw a very rudimentary map, if you're me, and then you sticker or markers or crayons to really draw a picture of how bees would be your campus or any pollinator for that matter. So go outside. That's the number one tool that I would suggest is the areas right directly around you on a sunny day. That's a great rec That's a great tool. And I often think with, uh, you know, with uh, school garden programs, you know, these, uh, there are already on campuses, these really, um, these resources that have been put in and they're become a very rich uh, learning environment. Um, it's kind of, I like the way they're yeah. paired with the observation hive because it really does, uh, you know, forces you to look, it is hands-on. You're looking at real landscapes rather than a book or something. Um, that's a wonderful suggestion. Yeah. And everyone has access to the areas directly around them. So there's no cost to walking outside. Okay, our last uh, question is, uh, do you have a favorite pollinator? And uh, maybe honeybees, but maybe you have, um, tell, tell us what your favorite <laughs> pollinator is. That's such a difficult question because I think they're all wonderful. There are pollinators that bring us chocolate. There are pollinators like the honeybees that do so much. Um, but don't tell the honeybees, but I think my favorite pollinator as of late would probably be the monarch butterfly. Um, it's a silly reason a little bit of sorts, but I was rereading a book by Rachel Carson about Rachel Carson a few weeks ago, and she noted how they were a source of inspiration to her and how uh -huh. one butterfly does not make the entire migration south, but a whole host of butterflies works together to make that journey in several lifetimes. And I think that message is very similar to the bees in their hives. We can learn so much from communities working together towards a common goal and that's just everyday magic, if you ask me. So I've really been enjoying <laughs> watching watching the monarch before it got a little chilly here. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for um, taking time to tell us about uh, the Bee Cause Project. I'm um, really excited to um, introduce the project to people who didn't know about it in uh, the Pacific Northwest region. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And if anyone wants to get a hold of us, you can reach us at info at thebecause.org or on our website at thebecause.com. Oh, and we should mention your your website. If you if you know the website, it has been revamped. It looks really nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're excited about it. 
Thank you so much for listening. The show is produced by Quinn Sinan Neal, who's a student here at OSU in the New Media Communications Program. And the show wouldn't even be possible without the support of the Oregon Legislature, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, and Western Sarah. Show notes with links mentioned on each episode are available on the website, which is at Pollination Podcast. OregonState.edu. I also love hearing from you, and there's several ways to connect with me. The first one is you can visit the website and leave an episode specific comment. You can suggest a future guest or topic, or ask a question that could be featured in a future episode. But you can do the same things on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by visiting the Oregon Bee Project. Thanks so much for listening, and see you next week.